Well, if you would please turn to the book of James, the second chapter. I'm going to read beginning at verse 1. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you've been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. But whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's bow together, please, in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity we have to fellowship together to exalt your name in song and in the preaching of your word. Lord, to encourage each other, to stir one another up unto love and uh, good works. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here with us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who indwells us and teaches us, who convicts us and corrects us. Lord, may you carry out that ministry in each one of our lives tonight. Lord, we pray for anyone with us tonight who's not a believer, that even this night, Lord, you might bring your word home to their heart in an effectual, powerful, irresistible way and lead them to yourself through faith in your Son. Lord, you're so good to us, and we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, Lord, your faithfulness. We pray this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. The foundation for this second chapter that we begin studying tonight is the first chapter that we just completed, the last few verses especially, where we saw that there's a distinction made between someone who is a doer of the Word of God, that is the pattern of their life. They don't just listen to the Scriptures, they actually live out the truth of the Word of God. There's a distinction made between doers of the Word of God and hearers only. And God says to us in that first chapter that if someone is a hearer only, they deceive themselves. They are also spoken of in the latter part of chapter 1 as the person who thinks himself to be religious but cannot bridle his tongue, deceives his own heart. This man's religion is worthless. There is a type of religion that is worthless, that is self-deceiving. It is the religion of the hearer only. It is the religion of someone who has the kind of religion that changes perhaps what they say, but it has not changed their heart, and so it does not change their life. On the other hand, the doer of the Word of God is the kind of person that will be engaged in that pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God, spoken of in verse 27. The kind of person, according to this first chapter, who is blessed, the doer of the Word of God, God says, is blessed. And so the Lord has given us this contrast between a religion that is vain and a religion that is valuable, a religion that is sham and surface and empty, and a religion that is real and from God and rewardable. And after leaving us with that foundation, 
Now, beginning in chapter 2, and really for the rest of this epistle, James is going to build on that foundation. And he's going to bring before us example after example of what it means to do the Word of God. Are you a hearer or are you a doer? Well, here is what it looks like when the Word of God is in action, in a life. Here's what it looks like when we are doers of the Word of God. And it is amazing to me. I guess it shouldn't amaze me, but it is something that I think is not only important, it's something that's very interesting. We need to take note of this. It's interesting where James starts. If we think of being a doer of the Word of God, we tend to think first in terms of projects, programs, activity. We think, now, if someone does the Word of God, here's what they're going to be doing. Here's the kind of thing they're going to be involved with. Here's the kind of activity they're going to be engaged in. But that's not where James starts. He doesn't begin with programs. He doesn't begin with projects. He begins with people. And James doesn't even begin, not really, not when we understand these verses, he doesn't even begin with how we treat people. He begins with how we view people. If the Word of God is active in our lives, it will change the way we see life. It changes the way we see people. It changes the way we see God. We see ourselves. We see others. We see the world. We see what is valuable. It changes the way we see everything. And so James begins chapter 2 by talking about a specific sin that we are to avoid, and it has to do with how we view people. Please make a note in your mind tonight. You cannot believe the truths of the Bible and not have it change your relationship. You can't believe the truths of the Bible and not have it change the way that you relate to the person you're married to or the way that you relate to your children or to your parents. God's Word will change us in the area of our relationships. And something else to note is you cannot separate human relationships from divine fellowship. You cannot separate the way we behave toward people from what we really believe about God. What we really believe about God is reflected in the way that we think about other people and the way, eventually, that we treat them. You can't separate these things. These things are joined. By the way, it's also interesting to note that in the second chapter, that's really what James is doing. He's taking doctrinal points and then making application of them in the realm of relationships. For example, in verses 1 through 4, there is the doctrine of the deity of Christ. If you really believe that Jesus Christ is God in human flesh, it ought to change the way you treat people. We'll see that tonight. And then in verses 5 through 7, there is the doctrine of the grace of God in salvation. And if you really understand the grace of God, it will change the way you treat other people. And then in verses 8 through 11, you have the doctrine of the Word of God. And if you really believe what the Bible says about itself... If you really believe what God has revealed about His Word, it will change the way you treat people. And then in verses 12 and 13, you have the doctrine of the judgment of God. And how we think about the judgment of God will change the way that we treat people. Over and over again, as we study God's Word together, we're going to see how practical doctrine is. What we believe about God affects everything in our lives. Everything. And so tonight we begin with that first doctrine the deity of Christ, and we ask, how does it affect the way we treat people? Look again at verses 1 through 4. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes. And you say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? There are three things we're going to see here tonight. Number one, the prohibition. You see that in verse 1. The prohibition. Prohibition. 
The second thing we're going to see is the illustration. You see that in verses 2 through 4. And then third, as we look at all four verses, we're going to see the connection to our understanding of who Jesus Christ is. You have a prohibition in verse 1, you have an illustration in verses 2 through 4, and it all relates to what we believe about Jesus. Notice the prohibition. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. There's the prohibition. And what's interesting about it is it is constructed in such a way that James is calling for something to stop that is already going on. In other words, um, the Greek construction implies that they were already guilty of personal favoritism and it needed to stop. It's already going on among his readers. And this is, this is a sin that we're all very prone to. I'm convinced, in fact, this is one of the great sins characterizing the church of our day. This is one of the great sins characterizing American Christians in our day. The sin of partiality. The sin of being a respecter of persons. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about personal favoritism. Verse 1, with an attitude of personal favoritism. Respecting persons. So let's think, first of all, about that sin. What does it mean to be a respecter of persons? Are you guilty of this sin? Are you guilty of this mindset? Well, first, I think it's really important whenever you define something to be clear about what it's not. We, we have this tendency to take God's Word and misunderstand it and apply it in ways it was never meant to be applied. So let's be clear what he's not talking about. James is not saying that it's sinful to show proper honor or respect. The Bible not only allows for us to show honor where honor is due and respect where respect is due, the Bible commands us to show honor where honor is due and respect where respect is due. You're not a respecter of persons just because you show proper honor and respect. That's a part of biblical Christianity. The Bible teaches there are certain respects that ought to be paid in family life. There are certain respects that ought to be paid in society in general, for example, toward the elderly and those who govern us. The Bible teaches there are certain respects to be paid in church life. The Bible even teaches there are certain respects to be paid toward those who genuinely love God, just in terms of respecting a kind of life, a kind of godliness. The Bible teaches there are certain respects to be paid in the work realm. And it's not being a respecter of persons to show the right honor and respect. I've known people who profess to be Christians who have been very rude and very unmannerly and very disrespectful all in the name of, I'm not going to be a respecter of persons. And they totally misunderstand this passage. For example, just to give you examples where the Bible teaches us to show respect, 1 Thessalonians 5.12 says this, But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Now there God clearly says, respect your pastors. Hold them in high esteem. In the realm of work life, 1 Peter 2.18 says this, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. You mean I am to respect someone for whom I work, even if they're unreasonable? That's what the Bible says in 1 Peter 2.18. In Ephesians 5.33, in the realm of marriage, it says this, Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife, even as himself. In another place, the Bible teaches we're to understand that our wives, men, that they are fellow heirs with us of the grace of life. We're to treat them in that way. The end of the verse says, and let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. So there's a respect that a wife is to give to her husband. There is a respect that a husband is to give to his wife. And then in the realm of, of just society and how it ought to be reflected even in the church, in 1 Timothy 5.1 it says, Do not sharply rebuke an older man, 
but rather appeal to him as a father, to the younger men as brothers. And so there's just a general respect. For example, if God were to call upon you to rebuke someone, to bring the truth to them in a rebuking way, if it's an older man, you don't sharply rebuke him. You appeal to him as you would a father. And even if it's a younger man, you're to deal with him as a brother. How would you correct your brother? That's how you're to deal with that man. So just keep in mind, when we talk about not being a respecter of persons, the Bible is not saying that we're not to show respect where respect is due. The Bible teaches just the opposite, that we ought to do what is right in the sight of all men. That includes showing respect. You say, well, then what is it to be a respecter of persons? Well, make note of this in your mind. To respect persons has to do with a wrong standard of evaluation. To be a respecter of persons or to show personal favoritism is when we judge people favorably or unfavorably by a standard that God never intended to be the standard. That's what it means. When I think of you in a favorable way or I think of you in an unfavorable way and my standard for judging you, listen, is the same standard that an unbelieving world uses. Now I'm a respecter of persons when I use a worldly standard for judging people. And almost always when you talk about the world standard, it is an external standard. And it certainly is not a spiritual standard, as this illustration points out. It usually has to do with things that are impressive to a world that rejects Christ. How does the world evaluate people? Things like money. How much money do they have? How much money does he make? How much money did he inherit? Or she inherit? Possessions. What house do they live in? What neighborhood do they live in? What car do they drive? Things like education. How many degrees do they hold? Where do they go to school? Uh, how intelligent do they appear to be? Position. Oh, he's the president of a company. Oh, he's the, the uh, chief executive there. Oh, he belongs to the board. Oh, whatever the case may be. Position impresses the world. Influence impresses the world. Reputation impresses the world. Fame impresses the world. Isn't it amazing what people will do when it comes to fame? I mean, how people are impressed by it. They will even brag about whose presence they've been in. Yeah, I, I, I stood once next to, you know, a cardboard image of Elvis. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, what impresses people, but it's amazing how fame has that effect on people. They'll pay big money for something signed by a person, touched by a person, owned by another human being. You see, that is to be a respecter of persons. When you evaluate things based upon what is external, based upon things that impress a lost and dying world. Nothing that has to do with godliness. Nothing that has to do with the heart. And James says that that kind of attitude, get this, is a contradiction to all that you claim to believe when you say that you're a Christian. And he says, in no uncertain terms, do not do this. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Do not be a respecter of persons. Now, just in case we don't get it with definitions, James gives us an illustration. As he's been doing throughout this book, he gives us sort of a test case. And what James does in verses 2 through 4 is he sends two visitors into our service. Let's make it practical tonight. Let's imagine that the church that James has in mind is Spring Memorial Baptist Church. And here we are, the, the setting, first of all, is clear in verse 2. If a man comes into your assembly, here we are, we're gathered for worship, we're in the midst of worship, or we're about to begin our worship service. And the situation is also found in verse 2. If a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, 
There's the setting. There's the situation. We're gathered for worship, and in come two visitors. One comes in who is dressed as a dignitary would be. It is obvious to see from his dress that he is wealthy. He is important. He is influential. Where where it says in verse 2, with a gold ring, that's really a poor translation. It is literally a gold-fingered man. In that day, people would display their wealth by the jewelry that they would wear on their hands, and sometimes women would weave gold jewelry into their hair. And so the picture is the man comes into the assembly and his hands are covered with gold. And he's dressed in, literally when it says fine clothes, bright or brilliant clothing. His clothes are new and glossy and attractive, and his hands tell the story of his position in society. This is a wealthy, influential, important man of great reputation. And at the same time he walks in our back doors, there comes in another man who is a complete contrast to the first. This man is obviously a poor man. He has no rings on his fingers. And his clothes are shabby. In fact, worse than shabby, the Bible says they are dirty, filthy. It comes from the same word, same root, rupas, which is found in chapter 1, verse 21, where it says, therefore, putting aside all filthiness. That word filthiness in in chapter 1, verse 21, comes from the same root word, rupas, as the word translated here, dirty, in verse 2. So this, this man comes in in filthy garments. By the way, it is not necessarily the picture of someone who didn't work or was lazy. In, in this day, a poor man may only own one set of clothes, and he may not have the ability to wash himself due to his living conditions as often as someone who had money. And so what you have here is just someone who is poor, and as a result of their poverty, they have maybe one set of clothes, and as a result of that, those clothes don't smell very nice, and they don't look very nice. Here comes in a, a man dressed in filthy, worn-out, dirty, shabby clothes. They both, both walk through our back door. Here is where the sin takes place, verse 3. And you pay special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. James says we pay special attention to the rich man. Literally, we set our gaze upon him. He catches our attention. The two men walk in, but the one who catches our attention is the one who obviously is wealthy. And the Greek word carries the idea of our countenance being lifted up or lighted up. Our eyes kind of light up when we see this man walk into the room. Our face brightens and we move to assist him. We want to make sure that he knows that he's welcome. We want to make sure that his worship experience is an enjoyable one. But the poor man hardly catches our notice. We show him no special attention. We show him no special kindness. In fact, we say to him, you stand over there or you can sit down on the floor. In the synagogues of these day, of this day, there were seats usually at the front, very few, And there were benches along the walls. Most people would come in. They would sit in a service crossing their legs. You Remember you read about the chief seats in the synagogues. Those would be the ones up front. And the picture is, and usually, I would imagine in most of these places, uh, in some, some cases it would be standing room only. But we make sure that this rich man has a place to sit down. And we make sure that he's not sitting on the floor or on a footstool. We make sure he's sitting in one of the chief seats. We're going to take care of him. To put it in our day, in our context, we we usher him down to the front row or wherever he wants to be. But we say to the poor man, you stand over there or you sit here. Notice what James reveals in verse 4. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? James says, do you know what you've just done? You have just uncovered a secret about yourself. 
you have just uncovered the fact that you are operating with evil motives. Folks, let that sink in. What kind of motives does he say they are? Verse 4. What does it say? Evil motives. And in fact, he puts it strongly in verse 9. But if you are showing partiality, you are committing what? Sin. And are convicted by the law as transgressors. James says it is sin. James says it is evil. James says your motives are wrong. At this point, let me uh, offer some applications. Number one, we need to know that money and material things are used by God to test us. God uses money to test His church. God uses money to test His people. Think about it, beloved. Why would you show special attention to the rich man? Why does James talk about our motives here? And why does he say they're evil motives? Because the reason why we would show attention to the rich man is that a church could imagine that the rich man, if he becomes a part of the congregation, maybe he could benefit us. Maybe he could benefit the church financially. Maybe he could benefit the church in terms of reputation. Oh, do you know where so-and-so goes to church? He or she, they go, they go there. The Lord allows us to be tested. What will a believer do? What will a church do to secure the good favor or to maintain the good favor of people who are materially prosperous? It's a great test. Tests us in a lot of different ways. And I'm afraid that many churches in our day are failing the test. It tests us when it comes to our ministry emphasis. What are we going to emphasize in our ministries? Are we going to, are we going to emphasize entertainment? Or are we going to emphasize the Word of God? Are we going to emphasize just getting people together to enjoy each other, or are we going to emphasize holiness and godliness? Are we going to emphasize what the New Testament emphasizes, or are we going to emphasize what the world wants to emphasize? What are we going to do in order to make sure that we are numerically prosperous and financially prosperous? What compromises are we willing to make? There's no doubt in my mind, none. There are pastors and there are church members across this country who know of certain things that should happen in churches and they strategically choose not to do it because of what it would cost them financially, numerically, and in reputation. Beloved, if you think I'm exaggerating, you're wrong. I, it saddens my heart to say I have personal friends that I, can, that I have talked to and they would say to me, Richard... I know these are things we need to do in the church. I know these are things that are wrong in the church. I know these are things that ought to be addressed in the church. But I just don't think it's the time to do it. Why not? I cannot judge their hearts. Don't pretend to. But I know this. Sometimes those choices are made not to address certain things because they deem it to be too costly. And beloved, I believe it is too costly to disobey God. I think if we're going to count a cost, we need to count that. How costly is it to disobey the Lord? That's the greatest cost. It tests us when it comes to our doctrine. What are we going to preach? What are we going to teach? Are there certain things we're going to avoid? The formula is out there. You know that, don't you? The formula has been established. If you want the church to be big, if you want the church to be rich, you talk about relational issues, marriage, raising children, success-oriented issues, and you don't talk about sin, and you don't talk about hell, and you don't talk about personal holiness, and you certainly don't talk very long. Make sure you talk about 15 to 20 minutes Make sure you sprinkle it with lots of stories, funny things, and illustrations, 
and it is a proven formula in this country, you'll build a big church. Test us when it comes to our doctrine. This tests us when it comes to our choices for leadership. Who's going to be a leader in the church? Who's going to be allowed to serve? Who's going to be allowed to lead? For a while I was in First Baptist Church Dallas, and it's amazing that uh, many or most of their deacons are millionaires, at least at that time. And I don't mean that as an indictment. Those men may have been great and godly men. But beloved, listen, money does not make one a leader in the church. Influence does not make one a leader in the church. There's a difference between worldly reputation and a reputation for godliness. And just because someone is a leader in some realm in the world that gives them respect doesn't mean that they ought to be elevated to a place of leadership in the Lord's church. There's a different standard of leadership and of evaluation. And what do you do when someone who has money wants to lead in some area of church? Maybe they want to teach a Sunday school class. Maybe they want to uh, serve in some capacity. But you know that their faithfulness is not there and the godliness is not evident. What are we willing to do to make sure they stay? Those are issues being faced in churches all over this world all the time. What is the Lord allowing that for? He's allowing His church to be tested by material things. What do we hunger for? The power of God, the provision of God, or things that we can work out in our own minds? What are are the things more important to us? It tests us when it comes to our own thoughts about provision. Well, well, if if we don't have this and if we don't have this, how are we going to make it? Listen, the last time I checked, the Lord provides for His church. And if, if the provision doesn't match what a church is wanting to do, then trust that the Lord provides for what He wants done. So reevaluate then what you're doing. So we ought not to be a people who fret and worry and act as if God is not where God is, which is on His throne and in control and with absolute power. God doesn't just own the hills and the cows on it. He owns everything under it too. And everything all around it. He's God. So the first application I would make is, when you think about this rich man walking in, what's going on is a test. Rich man, poor man walk in. Here's a test. Money and material things are testing the motives of these people. Tests us all the time. You know, I'm talking right now in the, in the context of church ministry, but let's talk about personal life just for a moment. These, these are the same tests that come to you, beloved, every day when it comes to family versus money. Time to invest in your church and in ministry versus money. You face the same test. What are our motives? There's a second application. You have to know that the problem was present before the church service started. When those two men came through and James in his illustration shows them paying special attention to the rich man, you have to know that didn't just happen. What was demonstrated in that moment was just the expression of how these people thought and how they felt every other day of their life. This was already how they evaluated people. This was already how they looked at what's important. This was already what impressed them. All that happened in that church service was it was put on display. It was demonstrated. One of the great tests of our walk with God is, are you impressed with the person of men? Be honest with yourself tonight. Does money impress you? Does education impress you? Are you impressed by position or influence? Are you impressed 
by fame or reputation? Are you careful to stay on good terms with certain kinds of people? Is it important to you in a special way how these people, wealthy, influential, important people, how they think about you? How they relate to you? Do you hunger for these things? Do you have a hunger for money? Do you have a hunger for influence? Do you act differently around those kinds of people? Do you try to impress where those things are present? Are you the social butterfly? Community conscious when it comes to your image? If these things are true of you, don't you know what that is? That's worldliness. Shallow. It points to a walk with God that's either shallow or sham. You see, they had a problem before the man ever walked in the service. All that happened is, what was put on display is how they thought about things all the time. There's something else here. The illustration James uses points out a contrast in what we're concerned about. In chapter 1, verse 21, he talks about the fact that we're to lay aside filthiness. Moral, spiritual filthiness is to bother us so that we lay it aside. It's to be something that we don't want in our spiritual presence. I don't want things in my life that offend God. I don't want things in my life that dishonor God. I don't want things in my life that are spiritually filthy. I want to lay those things aside. Well, what happens in James' illustration is these people are turned off by external, physical filthiness. But what they don't recognize is in their motives, they are clothing themselves with spiritual filthiness. They say, that man's dirty, smelly clothes are a turnoff to me. Oh, but listen, those evil motives are a turnoff to God. It should be a turn-off to you. Which is worse, to have filthy clothes or a filthy heart. Which is worse, to have filthy dress or filthy motives. How often is it that in our churches, people have been received with open arms not because of inward purity, not because of godliness, but because of outward prestige? And how many times in churches have people been treated as unimportant who walked in purity but had no privilege? People who had genuine godliness, but they're not considered for places of leadership. They're not put in places of leadership in the church, though they walk in purity and godliness because they don't have any prestige. And other people, because they have prestige, even though they don't have a Real walk with God. They're allowed to serve in places of influence. I've been in churches where deacons didn't attend church half the time. Why were they deacons? Amen? The fact of the matter is, we ought to find people who are faithful. They're already qualified for leadership. Not take people who have influence or whatever the case may be and then try to Make them into leaders. The Lord makes leaders. We don't. And so we ought to recognize those who are already walking with God. And then, rather than just thinking in terms of leaders, let's think about ourselves. How often in our lives have we focused on making the outside look good before we come to church? But we give no attention to the inner man. I know most of you, I see you on Sundays, you don't, you don't come in here looking shabby. Right? We get up in the morning, we put on our, on Sundays, we put on our nice clothes, make sure our hair is in place or whatever the case may be. We come in here, we want to look nice. But now let me ask you, on Sunday mornings before you come to church, every day as you walk with God, are you taking note of what your inner man looks like? Don't neglect the outer. The lesson of this illustration is not we ought to all come dressed in dirty clothes. That's not the lesson. The lesson is there's something more important to God. And that's our heart. That's the inner man. 
Are we paying attention to that? And then another observation, this, this illustration puts us in the position of corrupt judges. James says in verse 4, Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Why did James put it this way? Because you're making divisions among the body. You're dividing the body into classes. Upper class, lower class. On the, on the basis of what people possess. James says this is the mark of evil motives. I want to ask you, my friend, do you, do you divide people into classes based on non-spiritual factors? Do you in your own mind and in your own heart, do you, do you divide people into classes best, based upon how they dress or the color of their skin? Fashion, wealth, position, education, influence. Do, do we find ourselves catering to certain people, hoping to get something from them and avoiding the poor because they embarrass us? What have you done? You've divided people into classes based upon things that are not spiritual in nature. James says it's evil. The Holy Spirit of God says it's evil. One last observation. This is very important. You need to know the sin illustrated here does not require the same action. Or to say it this way, if you never gave the seat to the rich man and never refused the seat to the poor man, you can still be guilty of this sin. This is what we do sometimes. We say, well, I, I don't make these distinctions. This is what churches do sometimes. We don't make these distinctions. We have a clothes closet. We have a food pantry. We have a place for people like that. You see, whenever we feel like we're doing something noble and good by accepting poor people into our midst, what we've just done is we've still made a distinction in our minds. When we feel like somehow we've got to condescend to associate with the poor, we still made a distinction in our mind. If that's our attitude, we're still guilty of the same sin. If we reserved all the best seats for poor people because we think of them as someone who needs special favor, we've still made the same distinction. James's point is, look, it doesn't matter whether they're rich or poor. What matters is, are they a brother or a sister, or are they lost? If they're lost, they need Christ. If they're saved, they're our brethren. No distinctions within the body. No divisions within the body. No classes within the body. That's the message. Not show favoritism to the poor. That's not the message. Don't judge people that way. That's the message. Don't think about people that way. So we have the prohibition, we have the illustration, but now we've got to ask this. What does this have to do with the first thing he says in verse 1? My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favor. Why does James word it this way? Why does he speak of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ and your faith in Him? What does your view of Jesus have to do with your view of a poor man and a rich man walking into your service? How does the deity of Christ, our knowledge of it, affect the way we look at people? Let me give you two ways there's a connection. First of all, the connection is seen in how Jesus viewed people. How many of you claim Jesus as your Lord, your Savior, and your God? Would you raise your hand? Now, I want to ask you a question. How did your Lord look at people? When we say we're a Christian, we don't just mean that we've believed on the Lord Jesus. We also mean that we're being made like Him, right? Well, how did He see people? 
Did you know that our Lord was famous for not viewing people based upon worldly distinction? In Matthew 22, 16, listen to this. And they sent their disciples to Him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one for you are not partial to any. Lord, uh, Jesus, we recognize this about you. you. You're not partial. You don't view people based upon worldly distinctions. Well, you know what? If we claim to be Christian, we ought, we ought not to view people differently than our Lord did. When Mary was washing the feet of Jesus with her tears and her hair, the person, Simon, saw a sinner and a prostitute. Lord, or the Pharisees said to Simon, I think it was, he doesn't, he doesn't know what kind of woman is, washing, is touching him. Jesus saw a woman who was forgiven much and therefore loved much. He didn't see her the same way the Pharisees did. When the world looked at the disciples of Jesus, they saw a nondescript group of uneducated men. Listen to what they said, Acts 4.13. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were marveling and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Jesus, however, looked at those men and saw men who by His grace and His power would turn the world upside down. He saw them entirely different. I think about Barnabas. What a godly man Barnabas was. I want you to look at a passage with me for a moment. Look at Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 and look at verse 26. This is after Paul's conversion. Paul has already begun to preach Christ. And he barely escapes out of Damascus. Look what happens in verse 26. And when he had come to Jerusalem... Acts 9, verse 26. He was trying to associate with the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews that they were attempting to put him to death. What does Barnabas do? He takes hold of Paul. People were not willing to see Paul for what God had done in his life. Barnabas was able to see Paul for what God had done in his life. And Barnabas brought him into the company of the disciples. And that wasn't a one-time thing with Barnabas, was it? Because we think about a young man named, what? John Mark who turned back on a missionary trip, how soon we forget, Paul wasn't willing to take him anymore, right? And who was it that took that young man under his wing? Barnabas. Barnabas had this ability, not listen, not to see people for who they were, but for who God could make them. And I want to ask you, how do you see people? Do you see people for who they are right now, or do you see people in terms of who they can be by the grace of God. We've got to learn to see... Barnabas saw people like the Lord Jesus saw people. And that's how we're to see people. So the first connection is this. When you think about our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, and you think about how He saw people, and he, how He was one who ministered to all kinds of people, to the rich and to the poor to those who had a reputation for godliness and to those who had a great history in sin. He ministered to all kinds of people. Not compromising, not in the way that the social gospel wants to present Jesus or the compromisers of the gospel want to present Jesus. No, obviously our Lord was and is God and His love was always a love in truth. Yet He wasn't a respecter of persons. That's how we're to be. But there's another connection. Maybe equally as profound, maybe even more profound, the connection is seen in how Jesus came to earth. James says, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. When we evaluate people, 
the same way the world does, listen, we stand in the company of those who rejected Jesus. What we may not understand in our ignorance is when we claim to be a Christian, but we evaluate people by worldly standards. Don't you know something, dear brother or sister? If you had lived in the day of Jesus and evaluated our Lord in that way, you would have never received Him. You would have rejected Him. God sent His Son clothed in obscurity and poverty and normalcy. Jesus came from the wrong city, Nazareth. John 1.46, Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus was not a graduate of their accepted schools. John 7.14, But when it was now in the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach The Jews, therefore, were marveling, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? Jesus did not have the approval of the people in power. The religious leaders of His day did not accept Him. Jesus had no wealth. Luke 9, 58, And Jesus said to Him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay His head. Jesus did not appear to have any special heritage in terms of the immediate family God placed Him in. His father was a simple carpenter. His mother was a young yet godly woman. He was born in a stable. Common. Jesus was despised and rejected of men. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem Him. Yet James said he was what? Glorious. He was glorious. He was God. Glorious God in an unglorious appearance. And when you're a respecter of persons, when you don't judge as Jesus judges, When you judge by a worldly standard, you stand in the company of those who looked upon the glorious God in human flesh and saw nothing glorious in Him. I want to finish tonight with some tough closing questions. Tough because we have to be honest with ourselves. Let me give you four questions. We're finished. Number one, Be honest with yourself. Do you make distinctions in your mind based on a worldly standard? Are you impressed by the person of men? And I don't want you to misunderstand me tonight. We ought not not to be prejudiced against the rich either. Or against the educated or against the influential. See, if if you get that out of tonight, you've totally missed the message. That's not the message. The message is people are people. Rich or poor. Wealthy or not, influential or not, it doesn't matter. And we're to see people based upon their soul. Do you make distinctions in your mind? Are you impressed by the person of men? Second question. Do you see people based upon their past, their present, or their potential in Christ? How do you see people? You look at their past and say, well, we just ought to be finished with them. That's their past. Do you look at their present and say, well, I just really can't see how they're worth much? Or do you look at what the Lord can do with them? Again, I want to stress there's discernment here as well. We're told not to cast our pearls before swine. There are certain judgments that are to be made within the body of Christ and even to some degree outside it. But I think you know what I'm saying tonight. 
what the passage is saying. How do you see people? Third question. Will you put away those worldly standards? Will you make a choice to put away those worldly standards of judgment and ask God to teach you to see people the way He does? Will you honestly ask the Lord to do that in your life? To teach you to see people the way He does? And then fourth, will you see, will you admit that you can't separate human relationships from divine fellowship? Will you see that you can't be wrong with people and right with God? And will you make your relationships right? You can't be wrong with your husband and right with God. You can't be wrong with your children and right with God. You can't be wrong with your boss and right with God. You can't have wrong attitudes toward people in your church and be right with God. You cannot separate your walk with God from your attitudes and relationships with people. We're to be at peace with all men as much as depends on who? Us. I don't know about you, but I think we could all agree James gives us a pretty tough test here, doesn't he? The Lord says this, Do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if you've done that, verse 4, you've become judges with evil motives. Verse 9, you are committing sin. Let's bow our heads together, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for the way that Your Word tests our hearts. Indeed, Lord, You tell us it is a sharp, two-edged sword that lays us open to the deepest part of our lives exposes the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. And I know, Lord, that every saved person here, Lord, we desire that in the deepest part of our hearts, our motives would be pure in Your sight. Lord, we also know, though, that there's not a person here tonight who doesn't stand in need of purifying. And so we ask You, Lord, in the gracious and patient and merciful way that you do, to continue to purify our lives, purify the way we think, the way we look at things, that the thoughts and the meditations of our heart would be acceptable in your sight. We ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.